Kia ora, kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, Hare mai ki tēnā hui uh, for Organic Week. Ki ngā iwi mana whenua i tēnā rohi, tēnā koutou. And a warm welcome to all of you who are here in this Zoom room for the first event for um, Organic Week, where we are discussing organics in sustainable communities. Ko lore ho. I am your host for today. I am a councillor for Wellington City Council, and I'm slightly rather passionate about the well-being for people and planet. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge our amazing guests that we've got in the room today. Um, Alicia Watson in the middle. She's the CEO and founder for NISA. Tim Packer um, on my right. I don't know where he is on yours, but he is a community gardener at Innermost Community Gardens, the Village Garden Project and Aotearoa Community Gardens, and Vicky Young, um, Wellington General Manager for Everybody Eats. Kia ora, panellists. Um, and dear viewers, all of our organisations and people on the panel today, well, we're all um, Wellington-based, so apologies in advance if it gets a bit to Whanganui Atara centric but hey, we've got the sun out today, so um, it's a good day for it. So panellists, you can relax a wee bit while we do some um, housekeeping and um, a little bit of an intro. So just for housekeeping, I guess we've got the little chat button there and um, this is all really all about getting your questions. So please do feel free to send them through while we're doing this for we today. We're really keen to hear from you. Um, we've also got, uh, we're giving away five spot prizes today, which I'll announce at the end. It's going to be a mystery on how we get there and um, bear with us. But we've got great prizes, starting with the first one, um, the Abundant Garden Book by Neva and Yotam K. There is a $50 gift voucher for Oob. There is an Incafe Organic coffee pack with stainless steel reusable coffee mug and a pack of delicious organic coffee, common sense goodie bags, I hope you've all got one of these already, but um, very covetable item, also made out of organic fibre, I can tell you, and a one year subscription to Organic New Zealand magazine, also a fantastic read. So. Um, yeah, let's also just give a shout out to our Organic Week Platinum sponsors, that's Countdown and Fonterra Organic. Um, as we know that hosting these hui or these conversations which help us to understand and discover how organics helps our health, our communities and our planet don't happen without these people, the, the support that we get. So uh, a virtual homai to paki paki if everyone wants to send her a clap. Um, for all that have helped put this show on today. So today's themes that we'll be discussing um, through our amazing guests are the two principles, two of the four principles of organics. So matatika, fairness, and ngātahi, which is care. And we'll see how this weaves through organics and sustainable communities. The first principle, matatika, is based on the belief that a healthy future means caring for the generations to come by protecting and restoring land and water to good health. And we know there is much to be learned here uh, in this context from Mato Tauranga Māori. And today um, we'll also be looking at ngātahi, ngātahi or care. Did I get matatika at the beginning or have I gone the other way around? So anyway, two principles, matataki fairness or ngātahi. Um, which is care. So both of them um, are very important principles and the other discussions for Organic Week later in the week will discuss the other two principles. So before I started, I just wanted to give you um, an idea of what Sil Wellington City Council is doing. Um, in my role as a councillor where I'm blessed and challenged, but one of my passions has been working closely with the DubCC team and the urban agriculture community to bring together a sustainable food network plan for Wellington. So Melissa, are you able to bring up the, um, the slides, please? 
And I think it's important to understand that councils or local councils play such a vital role in developing sustainable communities. So, so number one speaks to Matatika, where Wellington City Council, which is fairness, and Wellington City Council works in partnership with organisations like Hyde Bosch, our food rescuers, and City Mission and the Compassion Soup Kitchen. And just an example over what's happened over this lockdown is that uh, supermarkets that would normally donate their food to these organisations have been run short of supply because of the, the panic buying creating food scarcity. So Wellington City Council have been working on a project delivering fresh produce from growers in Levin who would normally supply the waterfront markets and making sure that we get these two organisations like Kaibosh. And Kaibosh has provided nearly 16,000 tonnes of kilos of food to 59 community groups that include marae, soup kitchens and council housing, which is equated to nearly uh, 45,500 meals. And I think you get a sense of the fairness of that kaupapa and that if these organisations weren't there doing that, what the impacts of that could be. So next slide, thanks, Melissa. So everyone probably appreciates that councils do tend to support community gardens because we have the land. So Wellington has over 20 community gardens and we support them also with a stone soup fund for tools, maintenance, and anything else that these community gardens might need. And we also run a program in partnership with the Sustainability Trust called the Fruit Tree Guardians. And we've planted almost 500 fruit trees in communities around Wellington. I just discovered that while looking um, this up for this talk. So I was really stoked to find, out, find that out. So wow. And Council also partners with Apiculture New Zealand for Be Aware Month to invite community to get involved and raise awareness about the importance of bees for our environment and food production systems. So initiatives like the Good Food Boost, where um, Council has partnered with the Sustainable Business Network to provide a food mentor, a mentoring program to support local, ethical, organic, social enterprise growers and producers. And I think Alicia will talk to this later, that it's not a fair playing field when you're trying to do things with principles. So having support to get underneath is really important. So Seeds to Feeds is the newest uh, food festival in Pornicke at the moment. Hands up anyone that's been to one. It's a summer long celebration, um, celebrating locally naturally grown community building food, which hits a crescendo um, with a delicious community based dinner experience in February, March. This one's at Vogel Hall with a community weaving around tables like a snake. Um, this year saw 11 suburbs, 161 team members, and over a thousand people connect through the food event. And just a quick plug, Jason said they're up for anyone who's keen to get involved and the launch will be on the 29th of September. So I hope to see you there. What we do with green waste at the, at the Southern Landfill in Wellington City, our capital compost um, processes 10,000 tons of green waste a year, including food waste from Wellington to restaurants and other premises. And then council also gives a, a, a proportion of this to help schools, child here, uh, childcare facilities to um, or complete native plant restoration projects. So it's really important that this is going into a circular system. So just to help our um, ecology this year, we have planted our two millionth native tree in the last um, that we've been working on for the last 20 years with community groups. Um, and this is important to improve our soils and waterways and biodiversity. And um, natural burials, this has become a very popular um, councillors in partnership with, it, um, on, with natural burials on a natural cemetery. And these are becoming very popular. And the idea here, if you haven't heard about it, but as you return your body, quite keen on this, to earth in nature's own way, allowing for conditions for speedy decomposition and regeneration of a natural forest above the graves. So in our long-term plan, we're looking to improve community wellbeing and look for waste solutions as over 30% of household waste is food. 
which not only creates high emissions at the landfill, but it is not going back into the circular food system. So we've created a new fund for 500K for the next three years to build localized uh, community composting hubs and a new direction for our team to work with community on using council land, road reserve to use for composting hubs and food gardens across the city. And there's Kai Cycle, which I'm sure many of you know about, which the system is modeled on. We are working on a sustainable food network plan um, that has a vision that Wellington has a thriving food network that supports resilience and well-being in our city. And this action plan will look to connect all the work that's being done already and look to grow it so that we've got this awesome food system for our city and region. And te ao Māori and opportunities for Māori food sovereignty are woven throughout the plan. So I'm sure you all appreciate that urban environments um, still have a long way to go to really uh, put an organic kaupapa into the work that they do. But I think you can see that they're also a pathway to the solutions for this. And I hope you get a sense of how council provides fairness or matataki and care ngatika to all of these systems. Okay, so we're just about to um, hand over to the lovely Alicia Watson. But just before we do, I'm just going to remind you to send any questions in through the chat. We're really keen to hear from you. So now I'm going to in introduce Alicia. Alicia is the founder of NISA, an ethical underwear and basics label that employs women from refugee and migrant backgrounds in their Wellington workshop. Alicia will be talking about NISA's commitment to ethical and sustainable production and what organics means to them. Okay, Alicia, over to you. Enjoy your kōrero. Kia ora, everyone. Lovely to be with you all today. It's a beautiful sunny day in Wellington, so we're all in a great mood here in the capital. So everyone, my name is Alicia, and that's me on the right there. Uh, um, as Laurie said, I'm the CEO and founder of NISA, and I'm really excited to be part of the Organic Week Aotearoa Conference. So NISA is an ethical underwear, swimwear, and soon to be activewear label. Actually, we're launching activewear later in this month. Uh, we use organic cotton and recycled materials in our Wellington workshop to sew the most comfortable and joyful garments you've ever worn. Um, we're a direct-to-consumer e-commerce brand. So 80% of our sales come through our own website, which is www.nisa.co.nz. And we also have a physical store actually inside our workshop on Willis Street. Um, and so customers can actually come and see their garments being made right in front of them and meet the team and see what like our workshop in action. Uh, but the most special thing about us is actually the people who make our garments. Uh, so here we have the NISA team. This is from a photo shoot maybe just before lockdown actually. So most of our team are from refugee and migrant backgrounds in line with our mission of inclusive employment. Uh, over on the bottom of the slide, you'll see a little map, which is the places that all of our staff past, past and present are from. This list includes Afghanistan, Aotearoa, Brazil, Colombia, Hong Kong, Iran, Iraq, Myanmar, Somalia, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Syria, and Vietnam. So we've had an incredibly international crew present in the workshop. Uh, from when we started in 2017 to now, we've employed 26 staff, 16 of whom are from refugee backgrounds in particular. One has gone off to start her own business and others have used NISA as a stepping stone to find work nearer to their homes. We see our mission as creating a place to belong. The starting point for this is at our workshop with our inclusive culture and hiring practices but this approach grounds everything we do. So from how we select our models to the products we create to how our customers feel when they wear our garments. Our inclusive employment mission came from my time working as a lawyer. Uh, and then outside of working hours, I was volunteering with the refugee community through the Red Cross and the Community Law Center. Uh, I met a lot of people that had lost hope uh, that were desperate for a chance to join the workforce in their new home, but were lacking opportunities. I was shocked to read that only 40 to 50% of refugees had found work after five years of their arrival, with the situation being twice as bad for women. 
I just saw so much talent and so much potential. Um, and I just knew that they, the missing piece was really an employer willing to give them a first job in New Zealand. So I was thinking about what I could do in this situation. Uh, there are so many amazing charities involved with helping to resettle recently arrived refugees, um, providing clothing, furniture, and just administrative help setting up new lives. Uh, but no one could really gift a job in that kind of a way. Um, so social enterprise had really caught my attention and I kind of started to dream and imagine about the challenge of creating a business that could do just that. So providing the people I had met with what they most wanted, which was just a job. Uh, so I handed in my notice at my law firm and, quit, um, and then started taking the steps to set up the NISA workshop. I get asked a lot why we ended up making underwear. Uh, I, have, I have a personal love of sewing and that was shared by many women in the refugee community. So I thought a business that created and sold garments would be a really cool place to start. The talented seamstresses we hired in the beginning could have sewn anything, but underwear came out top for a number of reasons. First of which is I, I really love secondhand clothing and um, I think there's just enough clothing in the world, but underwear I feel like is something humans genuinely need and something that most people are kind of reluctant to buy secondhand. Uh, underwear is also small and compact, which is perfect for the tiny, tiny workshop we had in the beginning. Um, and it's also universal. So we all love different clothes and different styles, but at the end of the day, most of us just want really comfortable underwear for the simple snuggle factor. Uh, so now to address our sustainability mission a bit more directly. Um, so a truly sustainable company places both people and planet at the core of what they do. Uh, we believe that a focus on eco-friendly practices with no concern for social justice does not tackle the exploitive systems that got us into trouble in the first place. And the flip side is also true. So a focus on social justice and people with no concern for the planet ignores the fact that we need a healthy planet for humanity to survive. To that end, we use organic cotton and recycled fabrics in our garments. We use paper packaging so that, that once the parcel has reached its new owner, it can all be recycled. And we also purchase emission offsets for our outbound freight to our customers. Overall, we see sustainability as a journey, not a destination. Uh, there's always more to be done and this work must be done for ourselves, our children and our grandchildren's sake. Um, we're actively investigating garment take-back schemes to divert garments from landfill at the end of their life. And this also feeds into a strategy around circularity and the desire that materials and old garments be broken down and new fabrics being made from them. We're also in the final stages of applying to become a B Corp. Um, so that's, that's the end of my little introduction. Um, it was a real pleasure to talk to you all. Um, our social media handle is nisa.workshop. If you want to follow us, there's our website. I've also created a discount code for all the awesome people on this call called Organic Week. Um, and it gives you 15% off until tomorrow midnight. So yeah, thank you so much for your time. Kia ora, Alicia. Um, I, I feel like you've undersold yourself a little bit there too, though, you know, you're just such a brave mission to get out and make that happen. And I know it hasn't been an easy journey. So I think you need a big uh, homai te paki paki for Alicia for your, oh, thanks, your journey. And um, <laughs> I won't let everyone know that I'm wearing some something uh, Nisa in honour of you today. Okay, great. Well, we'll look forward to talking to you in a minute. And I think you did have a question in the chat, which you managed to answer um, about swimwear. So that was very exciting. Um, right, now I would love to hand over to Tim Packer. So Tim is a community gardener who has been volunteering at Innermost Community Gardens for the past 14 years. He is a permaculture practitioner passionate about growing healthy food in a way that nourishes people and the natural systems we rely on. His ideal job description would be an ecosystem engineer. I love that, um, but that doesn't pay too well at the moment. So he's working for the Wellington tech sector. Um, and when he's not at gardens or at work, you'll find him sleeping under one of his olive trees at Stony Grove Orchard, dreaming of producing the world's best olive oil. 
Okay, Tim, we are looking forward to hearing from you. Step on into the Zoom room. Thanks, Laurie. And um, kia ora, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to have a week chat about community gardens. And, and look, I'd just like to take this opportunity to acknowledge Laurie for all her incredible mahi and support of our Wellington Local Food Network. And that extends to Wellington City Council, who without uh, their support, we just wouldn't exist. So um, thank you all for that. Um, so look, really, what I want to do today is just talk a wee bit about community gardens. And we all know, you know, they've been with us as long as villages and communities have existed. No doubt you're familiar with the term, but but apart from growing produce, what do they really do? What value do they provide? How do they fit into modern day Aotearoa? And importantly, what role can they play in our sustainable future? So those are questions I and others have been focused on for some time. And today, uh, with the time I've got, I'll just share some of our learning. So it's a bit of a numbers game with this presentation. So for those involved in community gardening, we all kind of instinctually know that the benefits of community gardening go far beyond those of growing a lovely nutrient dense spud or building quality compost from your community waste. The challenge is converting that instinctual knowledge into a quanti quantitative evidence basis, which is actually really complex and hard. Not to mention most of us community gardeners are so busy doing the hard mahi, they don't often look up and say, hey, here I am. Uh, and, and are the sort of people who are really uncomfortable promoting themselves, so we don't hear much from them, which can be a problem, and I'll explain that further in this presentation. But thanks to two recent um, research projects and all the awesome people behind them, we've been uncovering a more detailed story of Aotearoa's community gardens and starting to answer some of those questions about value and place. The first has been run by Aotearoa Community Gardens, which is an informal collective um, of community garden practitioners. They've all come together to find out more about the role of community gardens in New Zealand. We formed in, um, I think, 2020 as a result of the first nationwide garden survey, and that survey was run in 2018. Uh, the, the, the survey was initiated by Dr. Matt Morris at University of Canterbury with Sol Morgan from Sustainability Living Centre and Brendan Horty from by Pure New Zealand. It was guided by a steering group of community gardeners from around the country and analysed by staff at UC. We believe it provides the most detailed insights into the national picture of community gardening gathered to date. If you're interested in seeing the full survey, um, I've included a QR code in the screen there, so you can just photo that and follow that to actually see the entire survey. But here's a couple of key insights. The first thing we did was identify that there are at least 204 community gardens around the country. We've never really had that number before, so that's a good basis to start. 91%, uh, we actually had 84 of those gardens reply to a survey, and of those, 91% use organic practices, which is really interesting. 72% see their work as being part of their community's essential infrastructure. And not surprisingly, the vast majority of people involved in those are volunteer-led, right? So some estimation work was done as part of that survey work, and, and we calculate that on a weekly basis, at least six to 12,000 hours of volunteer work happen per week. Uh, so what are these people doing? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, for me, it's a, it's a huge unaccounted workforce doing all this tremendous Mahi, but what are they actually delivering? And, and uh, that's what we'll try and sort of peel down in this presentation. So uh, let's actually look at uh, a typical community garden. We'll, we'll um, look at Innermost Gardens, which is the one I volunteer at here in Wellington. And uh, we've been growing community through Hands on the Soil since 2006. Our garden provides a multitude of ways for folks to connect and enjoy regenerative gardening right in the heart of Wellington City. So it's very much a, a social venture supporting community. Permaculture principles and ethics are core to our whakapapa, and this is caring for the earth, caring for people and fair share. So here's some numbers. Between March 2019 and 2020, over 6,180 Wellingtonians benefited from innermost gardens in some way. Over 4,000 of those people enjoyed our hall and grounds from homeschooling to yoga, 
dance, meditation, singing. Uh, 480 people attended our quarterly community dinners from produce growing in our garden, cooked by some of Wellington's most talented cooks and aided by some very groovy bands. So there was lots of singing and dancing, always is the case. Uh, 620 gardeners applying permaculture principles, either through garden days, um, workshops that we won, projects or tending their own allotments. Uh, on a project basis, we planted 79 production trees uh, and 698 natives. Um, we've also got about 80,000 bees that do a lot of pollinating for us and fly all around the community doing that job and producing some honey for the um, Wellington Women's Refuge, which was part of a project run by the Bee Pool Collective. Our compost operation sequestered potentially 28,822 uh, kgs of carbon equivalent. We'll talk a wee bit about that later. All of this was delivered by 100% um, volunteers. Now the benefits extend well beyond these numbers into what I now like to call a halo effect over our community. We've been able to discover the breadth and depth of those benefits through a research project we initiated in 2017 in collaboration with Wellington City Council and Victoria University to research the value of community gardens. So this is the research, uh, it's called the Village Garden Project. And what we did with the Village Garden Project was really sought to under, uncover that halo effect of community gardens and, and how those impacts have on their communities. And we developed tools for gardens to study their own impacts and tell their own evidence-based story around value. As part of our project, Bliss Grace, our primary researcher, supported by her, Research Supervisor Fabricio Chica from Victoria University assessed 25 studies from around the world and then brought that research back to one of most gardens where we spent some time validating those findings through our own work. The story across all of those studies around the world is, um, is staggeringly the same. In a nutshell, our community gardens have fed us, connected us, taught us and allowed us to re-establish our connection back to nature. For those involved, they can be tremendously positive experiences that come from the act of just giving freely back to your community without expecting anything in return. They are as unique as the people that invest their time and energy in them, though at their core is a community space, some soil and good intentions. And from these simple elements, with an immense amount of positive energy, they deliver such a range of benefits for communities that go far beyond the act of simply producing food. The Village Garden Project uncovered 100 well-researched quantitative and qualitative value measures across six impact areas, including local food production, social well-being, civil service, environmental benefit, economic benefit, and health impacts. And then we developed what we call an impact framework so other gardens can um, research and develop their own story. Um, appreciate the, the poster here. You won't be able to see the actual benefits listed in the poster. But again, if you actually follow that QR code, you can explore those benefits through the impact framework that we developed for other gardens to leverage. So um, look, I'm a big believer that every good presentation should include a mushroom in it. So here you go, here's a mushroom. <laughs> but uh, more seriously, this is one of my pet projects. We're searching how to use Wellington's waste products to produce protein. So this is a brick made from coffee husks and spent grains from a brewer, um, inoculated with a native strain of goyme oyster mushrooms, right? And I think in the context of the organic sector, I think it's interesting to note that community gardens have often played an important research and development role for the sector. We're all busy with experiments all the time. So it's just another benefit revealed. And I don't think it would be a stretch to suggest that community gardens may have provided the earliest historical examples of open sourcing in our society, sharing ideas about produce and food. So uh, this is actually beautiful black gold from our uh, um, community compost operation there. Um, we, uh, we accept um, kitchen waste from our Mount Victorian community and turn that into compost um, at a fairly great rate. Uh, but what we discovered in our research was one really interesting or intriguing data set 
uh, that I want to share with you. So, uh, look, innermost gardens compost operation from March, again, March 2019 to 20, collected 7,477 kgs of raw kitchen waste generally from our um, community. That basically converted into the potential of 26,822 kgs of carbon equivalent um, in greenhouse gas emissions mitigated through quality composting methods of waste that would otherwise be diverted to the landfill and uh, start to emit methane, right? We worked out that that's around 850 compost drop-offs from people that basically have their bucket uh, and it's a seven, four to seven litre bucket on average. They walk an average of a kilometre, getting their daily recreation and drop off the compost. But the interesting thing to me that kind of blew my mind was that 93% were dropping off their kitchen waste because they personally wanted to contribute to climate change mitigation, right? So I, I just think that's, um, I think it's a stunning point. And I think it just shows Another example of our community gardens can all help us personally. Uh, on the Q code there, you can go to a carbon calculator where you can actually calculate your own um, carbon mitigation through your own composting efforts. So take a look at that. Uh, and on that, I'm reminded of this quote. I, I use this quote for a dissertation I created in a recent karate grading, uh, and, and it's from Mike Tyson. And, and uh, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face, right? the story of my life and I'm sure we can all relate to that statement as a society and a species we're all getting our fair share of hits to the face right now we've just been through one we'll be through more um, but um, I might have a terrible week at work and be hugely depressed about climate change and my inability to solve that problem but you know when I walk into a garden at innermost none of it matters anymore I garden with others I care for the land and the environment, I grow some great produce and I feel better. And I come out of that garden day with a smile on my face and hope. And I think we all need hope. We all need anchors like these in times like these. So I, I, I suppose my suggestion is to all of you, maybe when the world's forcing us to look a lot closer to home for our well-being as it is, well then maybe we should just do some gardening, right? And uh, I think, I, I think that's a really simple thing and it's so powerful. I, I believe in a future where we'll all look out for each other across the fence and we might even garden together in smaller villages or streets. Um, you know, one beehive can feed an entire street of people, right? The interesting and sad note to this whole story, which I was going to relate to you, is that despite all of this value, our national survey identified that at least half of our national community gardens are either struggling financially or have barely adequate funding. And I think that's something to do with my earlier comment about many of our gardeners just focus on doing the mahad mahi and not saying, hey, here I am, this is what I do. So this is what our work is about. My experience is that for community gardens to thrive and deliver the impacts they need to support from their communities, right? And so just don't assume that community gardens will always be there because they need, they are by their very nature community. Thanks. Kia ora, Tim. Wow, uh, I'm a wee bit blown away. So um, that was an amazing synopsis and I, I've never heard anyone be able to bring, you know, the value of the simple community garden in such an overview. Um, and I'll just share a message on the chat from Alaya Finn. Love your message, Tim, especially concur with your finishing advice. Thanks for what you do and how you do it. There you uh, go. So yeah, you. awesome. Hearing with us, Kilda, yeah. Okay, and the fun doesn't stop there. I'm feeling slightly overwhelmed already, and it's you know, and um, but now we've got the wonderful um, Vicky Young. So Vicky, step on up. Um, Vicky is a trained pastry chef, a private chef, and now recently the restaurant manager at Everybody Eats Wellington. Everybody Eats Kopapa is about reducing food waste, food poverty, and social isolation. Awesome. Vicky is passionate about all things hospitality, an avid baker of lockdown sourdough, wish I was your neighbor, and loves to champion local produce, instilled in her from growing up in a market garden family. She is part of Eat New Zealand's Kaitaki, a collective of storytellers working together to share Aotearoa's New Zealand's food story. 
Um, yeah, and you can also find her baking cakes, running dessert pop-ups from time to time under her alias Vicky Eats. Kia ora, Vicky. Welcome on. Come take off your mute and take over. Oh. <laughs> Kia ora. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you for the intro. Oh, I'm so honoured to be here. Um, Tēnā koutou katoa. It is an absolute honour to be on today's panel with this awesome bunch of people. So yeah, a bit about my many jobs within hospitality. My name is Vicky, and I've recently taken on the restaurant manager role at Everybody Eats. Uh, Everybody Eats is founded by Nick Loosley, a concept that came out of his Masters in Economics for Transition in the UK, where he volunteered at organisations that worked with rescued and surplus food. After working at food rescue charity Kiwi Harvest in Auckland, Nick founded Everybody Eats in 2017. So we, ne we now have two restaurant sites in Auckland and our Wellington site opened just over a year ago, beginning as a weekly pop-up run by guest chefs to now a permanent restaurant seating um, 60 people and running three nights a week as of May this year. We are a community restaurant based at LTV on Dixon Street uh, and we're open every Sunday to Tuesday for dinner. Our pay-as-you-feel dining concept is for everyone who walks through our doors. We take walk-ins, no reservations. Our resident chef, Jack O'Donnell, and our amazing crew of volunteers prepare and serve restaurant quality meals. We can do anywhere from 150 to 200 covers a night over two hours service, turning the restaurant over three to four times every night. Everybody Eats Wellington uses produce that would otherwise be destined for the landfill from our partner charities, Kaibosh and Kiwi Community Assistance, and most recently, Wonky Box to create a three course meal every night. It's like a mystery box sort of challenge, you could say. Our meals are served in a communal seating style restaurant where our diners come from all walks of life to share a meal together. The pay as you feel model allows people who can afford to pay for their meal to pay for those who can't, often being for the vulnerable in our community and allowing them to have a dignified restaurant experience. To be a part of this is truly humbling. So our panelists were given a series of questions to answer around the concept of matatika and nātahi. My understanding of these concepts relate very closely to our kaupapa, Everybody Eats. As I mentioned, the mission at Everybody Eats is threefold, to tackle food waste, food poverty, and social, isola social isolation. My understanding of matatika is based around the principles of kaitiakitanga, guardianship of our environment, and mana, manakitanga, the essence of hospitality. Everyone who walks through the door to our restaurant has the same access to a three course meal. Our pay as you feel model allows those who cannot afford to pay for a meal otherwise to have access to this too. Everyone is treated the same regardless of how much they're able to afford to pay for their own meal. Our volunteers choose to be there rather, rather than get paid. So they tend to be very caring and hospitable. Our diners have, have even said that it is the best and most genuine restaurant service they've ever had. We welcome new volunteers, and if, and if you're keen, we'd love for you to be a part of what we do too. Uh, you can sign up online by the link at the end of this presentation. Cool. So not only do our diners appreciate the service, we also receive many compliments around the other half of the hospitality, the kai. When I talk to the diners about the food and how we've used surplus or rescued produce from our partner agencies, I always get surprised reactions. By utilizing produce from the end of the supermarket line and surplus produce from local growers, we hope to encourage awareness around food sovereignty to consider the environmental and social costs in production, distribution, and trade of produce. Our partner agencies, such as Kaibosh and Wonky Box, are often collecting produce from family small family-owned small businesses and market gardening who would otherwise be, be unable to deliver their produce due to competition from the bigger companies or rescuing the end-of-line produce. The majority of our meat comes from Kiwi Community Assistance, who, among other food and household items, sort, freeze and distribute reduced the clear and surplus meats from supermarkets for charities like Everybody Eats. Together, we can work towards providing everyone access to a meal and tackle food poverty. By redistributing produce otherwise destined for landfill, we are helping reduce the amount of waste that goes into landfill. Food waste is a big contributor to greenhouse gases. As it goes into the landfill, it is decomposing without oxygen, 
and combined with plastics releases methane, a deadly gas 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide. According to the Ministry for the Environment, half of the waste we throw away is potentially still useful. This waste includes food that which, would, which could otherwise be redistributed or made into animal food or compost. So how do we build sustainable communities? This is a big question to answer and we are only a small part of the answer. I think working with organizations who also line up with our organizational vision makes us every step stronger to achieving this goal. Our main partner agencies in Wellington are Kiwi Community Assistance and Kaibosh. We also work with local composting organizations to make sure our food scraps are composted. Did you know food waste is one of the main contributors to climate change? Project Drawdown, a nonprofit based overseas, has one of the most comprehensive plans to reverse climate change. Out of their top 20 solutions, eight are directly linked to food. Reducing food waste is among one of the top three solutions. And most importantly, we have Te Tangata, the people. We have a strong volunteer crew. In fact, over 200 volunteers have walked through our doors to help since we've opened. We have individuals that come and help regularly in the kitchen for prep, service, in the dish pit, and out the front serving our guests. I ask them why they decide to volunteer, and the answer I always get is that they love being a part of creating something meaningful. It honestly amazes me every time. We also have corporate groups who volunteer their time, as well as guest chefs from local restaurants who come to run the odd shift. Our diners, our regulars, our supporters, by donating $5, we are able to feed one more belly, the generosity from those who can afford a meal and support us. It keeps us doing what we do. So I guess to answer this big question, it takes all parts of the chain to make this vision work, from our suppliers to our volunteers, and the diners who are now regulars at our restaurant, to how we manage and utilize our produce, right down to our individual and collective actions as responsible Kiwis. We were saying at Everybody Eats, feeding bellies, not bins. But we aren't only filling bellies, we're filling hearts. People come to experience Matatika and Natahi at our restaurant, whether they're a volunteer or a diner, and that has huge social impacts. We have people from all walks of life building trust and getting to know each other, something which is so important in an increasingly isolated society. So how are we at Everybody Eats showing that we're a force for good? We're a charity, not a business. So, but by running more like a social enterprise, generating revenue from paying customers, we're showing that charities can operate more like businesses to sustain themselves. We have inspired a number of other amazing projects like Koha Apparel, who repurpose clothing and provide a dignified retail experience for vulnerable people. They're currently running in both of our Auckland sites. And with that, I want to say a huge thank you for listening to me speak about the special mahi I am so lucky to be involved in. New volunteers and diners are always welcome, so please come on in. Please note that we are now open for dining under level two and continuing our Burger Welly next Tuesday, something you definitely don't want to miss. We have a trade me auction running for what, what might just be the world's most expensive burger. One of our volunteers has set up a give a little page to help achieve this. Check out the link. I hope to see you soon at Everybody Eats. Thank you, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora, Vicky. Wow, what a, what a phenomenal model. I just can't imagine that even, you know, five to ten years ago, someone presenting this as a business idea. You would have been run out of town. So it's just wonderful to hear. And it is just so needed, and particularly in that, that spot. So uh, ngā mahi nui for your mahi. Thank you. Great. Oh, well, it's wonderful to um, see all those lovely faces and a few great names. I can see some that I know, so kia ora. Um, but I did have um, a question here, so please um, feel free to, to keep send, sending them in. Um, the question here is actually from the Forest Hill community and it's for Tim. Um, Tim, they say we are about to launch a community garden. What would you advise in terms of benchmarking the value from the start? Yeah, I, actually, I mean, the, the Village Garden Project website that we've got links to on that presentation is a perfect place to start. Uh, if you look through that and just um, 
uh, what we basically got is that framework tool where you've got those hundred measures, but you can you can just start and start working towards. It. I think you can use it as a way to kind of bounce ideas off what you think you really are about, right? And um, I would um, not be overwhelmed by the hundred measures. I would just pull it back to basics because with every community garden, um, the the uh, the formula for failure is to try and do too much too quickly. So. Uh, my advice is just start small, pick some some uh, some core measures, and then you can start building your constitution around that. And I think with all community gardens, generally as charities or incorporated societies, um, we we develop the sort of the foundational aspects of that now, um, and and our foundation documents that actually go as part of our incorporated society. So that's a good place to start. Kia ora, Tim, and wonderful to know that all of that mahi is um, available for, for everyone to, to really, you know, to be shared. It's a way forward. Um, we have another question here from um, Sarah. It's quite a, quite a big one, but maybe this would be quite good for um, Alicia and, and for Vicky. What do you feel are the most impactful changes individuals can make to how they consume? It's quite big, so I'll give you 30 seconds each. <laughs> Alicia, do you want to jump in on that one? Um, well, on a very selfish level, I could say start small, like with your underwear. <laughs> um, but I think um, I'm really, I am a little bit skeptical, skeptical about like a lot, the, you, there's a lot of greenwashing out there. And so I th honestly think your best place to start is by just focusing on reusing, repurposing, minimizing. It's actually not commercial solutions usually. Um, and so I would um, just start with what actually makes you passionate and excited rather than what some book tells you, because it's going to be more sustainable if it gets you out of bed in the morning and if it's what you love to do. And it kind of develops a passion or interest you already have. Um, yeah, I think that would be my, my tips. Thanks, Alicia. I agree with you. Start with where your passion is. It really helps keep it up. Uh, food is a passion. What about you, Vicky? What do you suggest? I really agree with what Alicia said. And um, I think on like a food perspective, just being a conscious consumer. So really looking at the origins of where your food's coming from, the quantity you're you're buying and the quality as well. Uh, zero waste, so trying to find creative ways to use your scraps. Now we've always turned our veggie trim into powders or um, made syrups with the peels of pumpkin, for example. Yeah, small, small steps. And then share it with your friends. Oh yes, um, and then share it with your friends. <laughs> Um, I'm just noticing a few questions around B Corp um, in the chat. So I guess, you know, just, just recognising certification is just one of the big challenges for organics. Speaking to Marion Woods, she says, why do we have to get certified? Why shouldn't the people that are using the, you know, the non-organic products get certified? And that's always really stuck with me. But um, maybe Alicia, and um, could you speak to that certification and principle for your business? What what does it been? How do you see it benefiting your business? Um, it how like the real benefit I see in certification as a business owner is that it means I don't have to be an expert because I can trust the certification to actually have done the heavy lifting for me. So we use certified organic cotton, and it's also Australian certified organic. And I don't, have to, I don't have to be a textile scientist. I don't have to be a sourcing expert. I just know that with that certification, it's good enough. And that's what I see the real value in it. It's like kind of idiot proof, like anyone can get behind it, but you also miss out some of the complexity when you go through certifications. Um, so like certifications also kind of miss the picture because it's not, the planet doesn't care whether you have this tick or that tick, uh, but so it's, certifications have positives and negatives, but we, we find it just a really easy way to communicate about what what we do. And that's actually part of why we want to become a B Corp. I saw some questions about what exactly a B Corp is, and it's a certification for um, businesses that um, have kind of a profit for purpose, basically. 
Great. Okay. Um, I've got one more question because I suspected that the time would get away on us because it's such a huge, um, huge um, co-papa that we're dealing with here. But maybe Tim, I'll, I'll send this one over to you. And then if you can stay around, I'll mention the um, five prize winners straight after straight after we get this Tim, uh, answer from Tim. And Tim, it's quite a big one, but it really is is critical for future. But we'd love to hear about initiatives to bring traditional Māori gardening knowledge, um, you know, to to urban centres. And that's from mm. Louise mm. Evans. Could you um, contribute to that in some way? Yeah, sure. Look, I, I think I mentioned, you know, community gardens are kind of the earliest forms of open source, right? And and it's about um, sharing knowledge, um, sharing practices. And, and there is no better experience than, than that of our elders, right? And, and we need a society where lessons from our elders are passed on to um, one generation to the next. And, and um, you know, that's a, that's, that's a, there's a real risk of, that we lose that wisdom and that knowledge. And I think um, we need to act actively, proactively throw energy into reviving those lessons before we lose them forever, right? So I see important initiatives around the country, um, things like um, taro for Māori potatoes. Uh, we're actually trying to um, understand and isolate heritage varieties all around the country and heritage produce um, is an important factor in the fact that a lot of the produce out there that might be heritage has been grown for health benefits and uh, for benefits in terms of its productivity in local areas. So. We need to capture that in ways and support initiatives that actually um, uh, share the knowledge around in terms of local food practices, uh, traditional knowledge in local areas, and then capture that. And I think community gardens are a nice place to capture that and then to research that further and share the knowledge with greater communities so we can all benefit. Awesome, Tim, thank you. And as I mentioned, uh, Wellington City Council with their uh, sustainable food network plan will be bringing a te ao, ao Māori perspective and opportunities for food sovereignty. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing what how that unfolds. Okay, people, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it really is humbling and actually gives us a lot of hope. So I just really want to thank you all for being in the room. Um, a special thank you to all our speakers. Please support them in whatever way you can. Maybe come for a, a dinner at Everybody Eats or get a pair of Nisa knickers or come for a walk through Innermost and bring your compost, uh, bring your food waste. But just quickly here is, um, so Tiffany would like these winners to put their, na their numbers in the chat, please. Um, and she'll also put this up online. So Via Moral, you've won the Abundant Garden. Um, Mika Byerly, yay, yeah, you've won the Oob Voucher. Sol Morgan, you have won the In Cafe Cup and Coffee Pack, yay. And Marina Striokova, you've won the Common Sense Goodie Bag. And um, Duncan Maas, you've won the one year subscription to um, Organic NZ. So there you go, people. Um, I, I must say it's, it's Zoom opens up some amazing opportunities to, to be with you all from around the country. It's really lovely seeing people from different places, um, but also hopefully you can come to the Organic Week Hui. Um, I think it's going on in November, um, but I'll let our team be clear on those details. So once again, thank you to you all, nga mihi nui, nga mihi nui to our speakers and panelists for sharing their insights. And once again, a big shout out to um, our, our platinum sponsors for Organic Week, which are Countdown and Fonterra Organic, because we know um, kui like this wouldn't happen without their support. So kia ora tato, feel free to email if you've got further questions of any of the speakers. And um, yeah, ka pai to Butanga Wiki. Have a wonderful weekend. Kia ora.